going to introduce Luis Aronson. Are you going to use this? Or? Her talk is on Beyond Patient Doctor Communication, Moving Medicine into the 21st Century. We'll see if I can start that by actually getting on the mic. Okay, um, so when we think about patient-doctor communication, we often think about the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and there was reference made this morning in the med-ed section to the one-on-many. And that's more the part of uh, patient-doctor communication that I'm going to talk about. But I want to think about the one-on-many, but also the many-on-one. Because I think one of the distinguishing features of patient-doctor communication in the 21st century is that it's much more bi-directional or multi-directional than it ever was. Uh, so I'm going to start actually by telling a story of an experience I had maybe two years ago now. So I'm a geriatrician at UC San Francisco and I do house calls. So what that means for me usually is that I hear little bits of different things on the radio. Sometimes the same little bit over and over, unfortunately. Anyway, so I'm driving along. Uh, I've just gotten in my car after a house call and I turn on the radio. And it's a discussion of mammography. And there is a physician talking about mammograms, particularly for women in their 40s. Some of you will know this is a little bit controversial, and I don't want to uh, be uh, distracted by the controversy in particular. But so she's talking about mammograms and why they might not be a good idea for women in their 40s. And as she's talking and as I'm driving, I'm thinking, wow, she must have had media training. She's doing a really good job. She was taking big data sets, and she was speaking really clearly. Um, and giving good examples of things. And, and I was just basically impressed. So this goes on for a little bit. And I'm getting close to where I'm going. And then there's, they decide to take a call on this program. So they take a call. And it's a young woman. And she tells the story of her sister, who at age 42, with two small children, had a mammogram. And the mammogram found breast cancer. And it was a pretty bad breast cancer. But she got treatment. And she's alive and well now. And basically, that one story from a patient who called in changed the entire tenor of the interview, of the part I saw after that. Because what the doctor did was she came back again with more data. And she again was really clear and really articulate. And she still lost that interview. She lost the conversation. Because the story about the young woman with two small children and breast cancer found by the mammogram was what was winning. And everybody else who called in after that referenced that. So she kind of lost, lost her opportunity to influence mine. So I'm going to keep that in mind as we go through this talk. But uh, it's because she was speaking in a way that we spoke in the 20th century. When I say we, I say I mean health professionals. Uh, and maybe not in the way we need to be speaking here in the 21st century. So just to review here a bit. So doctor-patient communication for a long time looked like this, right? Um, you'll note a few things. We've got a white male. He's talking. <laughs> Poor guy here is listening. Um, but basically, it's a one-directional conversation. In the modern era, it's changed a little bit. We've got the computer. Uh, we've got a different sort of physician. She's in the home. But still, doctor-patient communication, the traditional type. Now, there's another kind here, which isn't totally clear, but it's here in the stacks here. Um, there is scholarly communication. So in the 20th century, there were basically two types of communication. You talked to the patient, or you published articles in scholarly journals, largely for people who had the same expertise as you did, um, and might actually have already heard of your work at a conference. Uh, and, and that was it. That was basically it. And then this happened. So I don't know how many of you here have a desk that looks like this, but you know there's some of the traditional things here. But there's all kinds of other stuff going on that really wasn't going on previously. And that has changed how we communicate, who we communicate with, how we should be communicating, and lots of opportunities to influence each other in ways that improve health and health care. So this is Clay Shirky, whom you may have heard of. He's written several books, but he really talks about the media. And he coined a term that I'm really fond of, which is a new communications ecosystem. And that just means the way we interact, each part in an ecosystem, each part influences the other ones. 
And the digital revolution has really changed everything about how we communicate. And we all live in this new communications ecosystem. And yet still, particularly in, in medical schools, there was a little discussion of this this morning, uh, we're still really training about doctor-patient or clinician-patient communication uh, and scholarly communication, and not about a lot of the other kinds that come up in this new communications ecosystem. And that matters because even doctors, even nurses, even pharmacists are first and foremost human beings, which means they're all doing this. People get their news online, on their devices. They tweet to each other. They post things on Facebook. It has completely changed how we learn, how we get information, and it's bi-directional, whereas things didn't used to be bi-directional. Now you actually can talk back to the New York Times if you want. OK, so some people may recognize this guy. I'm going to now give four examples of how a clinician, a health systems leader, an educator, uh, and a researcher have used this new kind of communication to further discussions of health and their own careers. So this is Kevin Foe, and you may have heard of Kevin MD. Uh, this is one of the biggest and most influential healthcare blogs. And this started because Kevin was a primary care physician in New Hampshire. And when something new would happen, generally in that favorite medical journal of people, uh, the New York Times, or sometimes given where he was, the Boston Globe, uh, he would get the same phone calls uh, and then later on emails from patients with the same questions. And he would have to answer each one. And he's a primary care doctor. He does not have time to do that. right? But he wants to do the right thing. So he realizes if he just writes it once really clearly and explains what's going on and then sends it out to everybody, that works. Well, so you can be sending emails to everyone, but, but basically the blog is born. Uh, and he becomes one of the greatest influencers uh, in healthcare. And now he has a blog to which lots of people contribute, uh, patients and clinicians of all sorts. This is Bob Wachter, who uh, yesterday we were told at UCSF, he's at UCSF, he coined the hospitalist uh, term and movement, basically. Uh, and it was named as one of the top 100 influencers in healthcare. And that is probably not so much because of his 250 medical journal articles, although those probably count for something. Right? Um, but what he decided was he was, he had started the hospitalist movement, and he was really interested in quality and safety. But he could not get any traction within medicine. So he started writing public articles. And in fact, he wrote a book called Internal Bleeding, which became a New York Times bestseller. And that got the attention of the people who actually do change policy, of the people in Washington. And it got people talking about it. And it was that move, that move into the public sector, that talking to people, not just within the profession, but to fellow citizens, that really led to the quality and safety movement. This is Roseanne Leipzig, uh, who is one of the better geriatrics educators, uh, which probably means no one but Leslie and I have heard of her. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she has made a huge difference in geriatrics education nationally. And she hasn't done much public communication, but she wrote one op-ed for the New York Times, which was the most emailed op-ed for a couple of weeks. And what it did is it took basically her life's work in developing what are core competencies for the care of older adults that each physician should have. Uh, and talked about it. And she framed it, uh, <laughs> it was published on July 1st. And she talked about how lore has it that July isn't a very good time to get sick. Right? Why? Because we've got the new interns. And then she talks about how it's even worse if you're in your 80s, because no one's trained on that. And she goes on from there. So she did it once, but she did it in a way that sort of brought what she had spent her life working on into the public and led to some changes and mandates in how we train physicians. This is Alex Smith, who's in palliative care. He came up with something called e-prognosis. And there was an article on this in JAMA. Uh, and so, you know, JAMA is a pretty good place to be published. And probably lots of people would read the article. But he's digitally savvy. And so what did he do? He did a, and he's sort of media savvy. So he wrote a piece for the New England Journal, which told a story of a patient. And if you were to read that, you might wonder, um, wouldn't it be interesting if I had a way of getting some sense of how long a person might live if they were 88 and had all these various problems? And that kind of makes you want e-prognosis. Then he had something in a blog that is often followed by the New York Times. So then the New York Times picks it up. And basically, then it goes national and international 
which means the research on which he spent several years actually has a much bigger impact than it would have even if it had appeared in JAMA. And JAMA is a pretty darn good outcome if you're a researcher. So there are all these ways that we can be engaged in publicly communicating our work and communicating with people and patients uh, that we haven't really taken advantage of until now. Um, the other thing that I should mention is in each of these cases, it allowed the people who had developed these things to hear back how they were and were not working for the people they were intended to serve, and that made them better. So this new communications ecosystem is already changing medicine. Medical journals used to only be science. And now, I don't know about you, but I get the New England Journal in my inbox on Wednesdays, and all I see are the essays. Actually, if I want to see science, I have to scroll down. Why? That's not just random on the part of the New England Journal. That's because everybody, including the clinicians, prefers to read the stories and essays over the science. Doesn't mean they're not reading the science, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and most conferences have, uh, have sections on, on how to write in this public way, but it really is a different skill set. OK, so this area we call public medical communication, and it's the third type. So there's doctors and patients speaking one-on-one. -on -one. They're speaking in a scholarly way. And then there's public medical communication. And that's basically a few different things. It's different sorts of writing or communication, right? We, we broaden what you can do. Uh, it's who you're speaking to. Who's the audience? The audience is really different. The audience has unlimited potential. And this was the new communication ecosystem that Clay Shirky talked about, right? the Arab Spring. There are all kinds of examples of how you can speak to people across time and geography in a way you couldn't previously. Um, it's, mo it's by health professionals, and then to further the discussion and understanding of health and healthcare. And that's actually different, too. It's not about me disseminating my results or us discussing uh, your diabetes. It's about really thinking about healthcare in larger ways. So it's a different kind of activity. So, why name this? Why, why even think about this? Um, well, there are a few reasons. One is that it's probably a unique skill set. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Why, why this sort of communication is different from the kinds we've done previously? Recognition. So Amin Azam at the, at the education section this morning said, um, people don't get credit for blogging. And they don't get credit for updating Wikipedia, as he's training medical students to do. They only get credit for the sorts of things that we used to do. And yet, if you write a blog or you update Wikipedia such that people get accurate information, you're probably reaching way more people. So we need to think about what's actually having an impact on health and on lots of people, and not just the traditional ways of communicating. There's also regulation. I don't know if you've been following what's going on with Dr. Oz, which is kind of ironic, because he was one of the first and best at public medical communication. He had a way of explaining really complicated things using illustrations, using analogies that really helped people understand complex ideas. Now, it's a shame when he began to use those talents, apparently, um, allegedly, uh, to, to sell some things you know, and some ideas that might not be true. So that's ironic. But we also need to, if we're going to recognize, we need to regulate that people are do using this for the good of patients uh, and not to sell things. And then transformation. The world, you know, we are already transforming how we deal with medicine and health, as we're discussing at this conference. And if you have the language uh, to discuss which skill sets and which approaches you're taking, you're in better shape. So now I'm just going to talk about a few ways of making this useful. And this, for those who aren't health professionals, are things that help us all communicate with other people. So there are five useful techniques. The first one is speaking English, not in jargon. And you know this when you hear someone who speaks in a jargon that isn't yours. But, but this is a, a message often lost. So just using regular words. Data. Less is more. So I like to say that data is a bit like sculpture, right? So the sculpture, what you see is what's there. But actually, what you see is defined mostly by what isn't there, by what you've taken away. So one of the key things with data is to make the key points visible by using only a few points and 
not so many. And this is particularly uh, where scientists and, and sometimes clinicians get into trouble. Next is getting personal. So this is antithetical to what we're taught most of the time. You're not supposed to put yourself out there. Uh, social media ha has sort of complicated that in some ways. But certainly in professional notes, in professional scholarly articles, you don't use the I. You don't put your opinion. But this comes back to the story thing of who wins the arguments. The human being wins the arguments. The person with the more compelling story. Uh, and if you introduce yourself or someone you care about and the act of you caring about that person into the story, you're actually going to win more hearts and minds. Uh, and if you don't believe this, look at all marketing. Look at how politicians win things. Our organizations understand this in the way they highlight stories. Think of the Olympics and the focus on different stories. This is how people get people's attention. Knowing your audience. So different stories and different focus will work for different groups. We tend to take a one-size-fits-all approach, and that probably doesn't work. And then knowing what you want. This is another thing. It's not just to get it out there. It's to communicate something or to begin a dialogue with someone and to be very clear about what you want. Uh, there's another thing that works, which is humor. But it actually only works for people who are funny, and most of us aren't so funny. So use that one with caution. Uh, but then really the most important thing is story. And I'm actually just going to borrow this final point from a guy called Paul Zak, who is a neuroeconomist. Uh, you can actually look this up on YouTube. Uh, and if you don't know what a neuro neuroeconomist is, that puts you in lots of really good company. Uh, but <laughs> let me explain it. It will become obvious. So he has a lab. And he brings in volunteers. And he has them watch a video. And the video is about a little boy named Ben and his dad. And Ben has cancer. And the dad is telling you about cancer and, and saying, look, Ben is playing. And Ben's really happy because he's been through the chemo and radiation. And it's ended. And Ben's playing. And he's happy. And then the dad looks kind of sad. And he says, but it's hard for me to be happy for Ben because I know something Ben doesn't know. And what the dad knows is that Ben is dying. And the dad goes on to say, you know, it's really hard when you know how little time you have left. And he kind of merges himself with his son in that moment in thinking he only has a little bit of time left. So in his lab, Paul Zak has people listen to that story. And then on their way out, they're asked to give money. You know, money obviously matters in the world. But think of money also as uh, an equivalent for voting or different behavior in terms of health. Uh, and what he finds is that the people who give the most money and who give money without hesitation are the people who've had two reactions to this story. Uh, one is a rise in their cortisol levels. So here's where the, the neuro of the neuroeconomist comes in. He's drawing levels. Um, increased cortisol levels, that gets people's attention. And that's associated with distress. So there's some distress. Not so much that they're paralyzed, but some distress. Uh, and the other one is oxytocin. And that elicits empathy. So one of the key things he's found is that if you want to change behavior, you need to use stories. And the stories need to elicit a little bit of distress. It's sort of three bearges, you know, not too much, not too little. Um, and then some empathy. And those are the things that are most likely to change behavior. And if you do that, speaking English, knowing what you want, being personal so that you're demonstrating the empathy, uh, that's the kind of communication that leads to the engagement, leads to the stories, the blog posts, the effective videos. Uh, the medical journal personal narrative articles, the op-eds that really are starting to shape what's happening in health policy and health care. This is the new desktop. And public medical communication is probably the third type of communication that people in health and medicine need to master uh, to sort of live in this world in which this is the reality. That I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, I mean, it gets a little confused because it's mixing lots of different things. I mean, there's sort of public medical writing and there's public medical social media. Um, I think social media is part of it in two ways. One is directly, if you are communicating via social media with, uh, with patients or with other providers that share your interest, um, that's one way. Another way is that social media has influenced how we connect and who we can connect with. So I think it's part of public medical communication. It's one sector of it. It's the one of the tools and ways we can interact. But I do think those same things about getting personal and knowing what you want and defining your space uh, all hold for that as, as well as other forms of public medical communication. We are teaching it is so far elective, although a fair number of people take it over, over the four years. Uh, and we're trying to make a sort of longitudinal curriculum where they're first introduced to physicians who are doing this sort of communication in a variety of different ways, um, from researchers, from people tweeting, from people writing op-eds and doing narrative advocacy, all sorts of kind, uh, different sorts of engagement. Um, then working on their own ability to communicate, the communication skills. And then we have a two-year course that starts in the third year, which is actually turning out to be a little challenging because mostly they have to take clerkships, and that's probably right. You know, like they should learn how to take care of patients. Um, but so they do it intermittently over the third year when they're in intercessions, and then they try and pull it all together with a final writing project in their uh, fourth year. Okay, thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.